It's another packed episode dedicated to restoring our Sega Megatech Arcade today, the machine I accidentally bought for £200 on eBay that turned up unloved and full of muck. But by pulling the team together here at the mill, from Heber, from the Arcade Archive and the Repair Shop, we've proven in the series so far that it's not a lost cause. And we're doing everything we can to make it worthy of a place in our museum. You should watch the first two parts to see how we've gotten so far if you haven't already done so. We've discovered our system board works, the main monitor works, lots of cleaning has taken place, and we did use our known good working cabinet with its power supply and wiring to test the parts so far. By the end of today, I want to have this looking like new and as close to finished as possible. And once again, it's gonna take the skills and the dedication of everyone here to take another step forward in preserving this little bit of Sega history. Hello Cave Dwellers, we pick up where we left off with our Sega Megatech Trash to Treasure restoration today. We've got a huge amount to get through, so let's dive straight into it. And it all starts off with that 10 inch monitor that we really need to get on top of because our one arrived broken. And I was put in touch with a man by the name of Bonehead. Now Bonehead said he had a, a monitor to offer us for 50 pounds and hopefully it would solve all of our problems. I found a really good way of funding that. You may remember that our Megatech arrived with six cartridges in and I already had a collection of them. Well, I managed to sell the duplicates. I managed to sell six of them and I sold them for 200 pounds, which you'll remember is the exact cost of the cabinet in the first place. So the cabinet has paid for itself <laughs> through the cartridges that were in there and that money can go towards the monitor. I actually sold them to a Swedish collector. 200 pounds for six cartridges is a very good price for collectors. So it made a collector very happy. It made me very happy and it gives us the funds to continue with our restoration. So let's start with that 10 inch screen and we'll also dive into all of the other stuff that we have to do after that. Let's see how we get on with it. So off I went on a four hour trip to collect it over near a place called Milton Keynes. When I arrived, I found a red phone box in the garden. We all keep one of these in our gardens in England, nothing unusual there, but there was no sign of a monitor in it and just around the corner, there it was. He'd left it on the log store for me. So let's drive this back to the mill for Holly to check over and see if we can make use of it. I'm told that this donor CRT has come out of a long since lost Megatech arcade. That doesn't mean it's a straight swap out though. Nor do I know if it's even in good order, only that the tube isn't necked, which is the problem on our original display. It's not without problems though. We can see here that the neck board is cracked in half. Now that's not a surprise, I was aware of that when I agreed to buy it. And the hope is that we can either transplant this tube onto our original chassis, or we can repair that snapped neck board and drop the whole monitor in. Neither is a guaranteed possibility, but these are the best options I can come up with so far. It's that part of the episode where I say a big thank you to PCBWay.com for supporting the channel and making projects like this possible. If you're working on your own project and you need PCB manufacturing, 3D printing, CNC work, and much more besides, then PCBWay.com is the place to go. And while you're there, make sure you check out their shared project section, which is just rammed full of projects to support vintage hardware. It's well worth a look. Thank you, PCBWay.com. So I decided the best course of action at this point was just to leave Holly to it. Nobody likes somebody hovering over their shoulder while they're trying to make sense of a technical problem, not least me, so we'll check in with her later. In the meantime, it's finally time to take care of the muck. I really need to clean this cabinet so that we can get on with the restoration, the cosmetic restoration, and other people won't be afraid to touch it and uh, the things that they might catch from it. So I wheeled it into the repair shop. I'm not bringing it into the cave in that state. And let's get to work on scrubbing this thing. In the light of the repair shop, it almost looks presentable, but don't be fooled. There's dust, there's grease, there's rot, and there's missing artwork to sort out on this cabinet. As someone commented on the last video, what we have here is the skin of generations of gamers past, carefully collected in our cabinet. On the one hand, it's quite poetic. 
on the other, utterly disgusting, and I hope you're not eating your dinner while you're watching this. Aside from all the grease and muck, there are some gouges in the side of the cabinet. The result, no doubt, of moving it from place to place over 35 years, and we'll need to sort that out before we apply any art to it, or it will be visible through that artwork. And then there's the, um, the locked doors that we need to bust into. Funny story about that, but first let me get suited up so I don't get too much of that old gamer dust on me. Lockpicks and a drill at the ready. The first door was easy. The lock was accessible from the rear of the cabinet and I could just take it apart. The other, well, here's the thing. I thought Richard had tried that door. He thought Holly had, she thought Alex had, and he thought I had. This is how you pick a lock, kids. Yep, nobody had actually properly tried the door and somehow it hadn't just flapped open when we were moving the cabinet around. I may be an idiot, but at least I'm a happy one now with an unlocked door. And even better is the arcade that keeps on giving. There's money in the cash box, and I'm sure I could hear more bouncing about inside the cabinet when I moved it. The milky bars are on me, if I haven't lost my appetite, that is. Over 133,000 recorded games have been played on this machine. Let's assume it was 20 pence per game. That gives us an income of over 26,600 pounds in its lifetime. It really has earned its retirement. And look, more money. I'd soon amassed three pounds 80. Let's deal with some rot now. Down at the base of the machine. The foot plate and the rubber mat, they're not in bad shape and I can decide if we're cleaning or replacing the rubber mat later but it's the rotten wood on the left that concerns me, and we need to take care of that. Before I call anyone else into suffering from touching this thing, let's give it a really good scrub down, and then we can take care of the rot. To sort out the sides, we'll want to take the T-mold off, and you can see on the sides there's the residue of old artwork, but someone has chosen to take it off at some point in its life and just have a plain black side. Not quite sure why they would have done that. Maybe the artwork was just too damaged to look presentable. And that sticky tar-like substance under the control panel came off with, a, with an extra clean. I don't know what that was, maybe old cola? Sweat? I, I don't even want to know, to be honest. Yummy. Some things can't be unseen, but washed, cleaned and degreased, I'm really happy with how that's come along. Let's check back in now with Holly and see if we've made any progress with that 10-inch monitor. The first thing that we noticed with our replacement 10-inch monitor was that it's a different model tube and a different chassis to the one we had. I'll pop the new one on the left of the table there. And then there's our old one on the right. The old is beyond saving, but in its broken state, it can give up some of its CRT secrets to us, which might be fun to see. For example, this part here, which I'll tease out of the neck, this is worth seeing. Here it comes. I, I don't know why I'm being so delicate taking this out. It's not like I can break the monitor any more than it already is, but there we go. Out it comes and check out my guns. This is the electron gun, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. Narrow beams of electrons shoot out of here accelerated and focused by a series of anode grids and guided by deflection yokes to precisely aim the beam. And if we peer down the broken neck of the tube here, we can see the glass front. That's coated in phosphor, which converts the electron's kinetic energy 
into light. And also the pattern of the shadow mask is visible. That's a metal plate of holes, which are RGB electron beams hit at slightly different angles, allowing only the appropriate phosphor color to display on the screen. I wanted to say the electrons tickle the phosphor, but Holly said no, no tickling happens in a CRT. If we shine a torch down the neck and look at it from the front, we can see damage to that phosphor coating, those speckles. What's probably occurred here is that when the neck broke and air rushed into the vacuum, it damaged the screen in this way. Let's get back to the task in hand now, and Holly discovered that the replacement tube is not an ideal candidate for a straight swap out with the broken one because the tube shape on one is slightly more pronounced, so the physical fit is an issue, and the yoke coils, she tells me, have a different impedance. This doesn't mean that they can't or won't be swapped, but she says it would then make it much harder to align. Our replacement tube also has some burning, and that's to be expected. Elements of the Megatech display never change, so the phosphor in those areas has worked really hard. I can also make out the list of games that were in this one. I can see Golden Axe, Sonic, and Streets of Rage were in this machine. I can't quite make out the others. Maybe you can if you look closely. So it looks like we're going to try plan B then, and that's to repair the snapped neck board and hopefully use every part of Bonehead's monitor. But all of that assumes the CRT actually works. Who knows what knock-on effect might have happened if the neck board broke when it was in operation. I don't quite know why that would have happened. Why would you have dropped a monitor or snapped a neck board while it was on? But we can't rule it out. Holly carefully cleans the edges where the PCB snapped, and then she uses a form of super glue, which I can't pronounce, cyanoacrylate, cyanoacrylate, something like that. She uses that to bond it back together, and it forms an extremely strong join. We thought we might have to 3D print a support for this to slot into, but there's no flex on it whatsoever, so there's no need. She then bridged each broken track using phosphor bronze wire and lashings of solder. Then it was time to break out the CRT tester. Now this was explained in the last episode. It's well worth a watch if you haven't seen that and it allows us to carefully power up the monitor to see if it works, to bring it back to life if it hasn't been turned on for years without an almighty surge of power that might cause it to pop unnecessarily. And at this stage, it's not good news. There's no high voltage in the tube, and I was hopeful that this would be an easy fix. This part of the restoration is really causing us problems. The sun set, Holly poured over schematics, and parts were ordered in the hope of fixing this, but they aren't going to arrive today so we'll have to come back to this when they do arrive and see if a recharged holly can crack the problem. Meanwhile, in the workshop, I'm delighted with how things are cleaning up. I'd assumed that this plastic marquee and bezel had been scorched with a, a lighter perhaps and permanently damaged, but it turns out it's just more gamer skin and it cleans off to reveal it's all in perfect condition underneath. The marquee sign I'll unscrew and clean the edges later, but even with it in place, giving it a clean, it came up a treat. I thought the heat of the lights might have yellowed the sign, but nope, decades of dirt perhaps have protected it. Not just this, but other parts of the system in the long run. I actually think the dirt has done this whole thing a favor. For the rot, I've called in the help of Alex, He's experienced in restoring many cabs in his own collection and at the Arcade Archive, who you should totally subscribe to, by the way. That's our sister museum. And this week over there, he's restoring an electromechanical Sega game from the 1960s. So if that's your thing, definitely go and watch that. I started off by cleaning any dirt on the foot there, just so we can get to the wood itself. I'm hitting it with a, a wire brush, and then we've got a nice clean surface to work with.
That looks good. Once clear, we'll apply some wet rot wood hardener that will seal it up and make it rock hard. In the past, I've used a mixture of PVA and water to achieve this, but Alex recommended a Ronsil branded hardener that he's used, and it certainly seems to do the job. And then we need to build this foot back up. It still looks slightly wet there, but it's just taking on a shiny finish when the uh, wood hardener has done its job. And the filler that we're applying, this is wood filler, it's designed to dry in about 30 minutes and it says to any depth. So we can work quite quickly. We can really slap this on and layer it up and we can roughly shape it into what we want it to look like. We let it dry and then we sand it back before doing it all again until we're happy with the end result. And it should hopefully look something like an arcade foot. While we're doing that, we also tackled the chunk missing out of the back of the machine. There should be a square vent hole and there's a bit snapped off of that. So we'll square that off too. And we'll need to get a vent cover to go on that eventually. And then we repeat the process until we're happy with the result. I have seen on my other Megatech cabinet that there are metal plates fitted to reinforce this part of the cabinet. So damage there, I think, must be quite common. Maybe we should consider metal plates in the long run, but we'll see how we get on with this. And then finally, Alex routes the edges for that T-mold to lock into. And hopefully, at the end of it, you'll never notice it was damaged. Before we touch the T-molding though, we want to get the artwork on. Here's a reminder again of how it looked when it arrived with all the scrapes down the side. And while the filler was out, I also touched in those scrapes, those gouges on the side, just to even things out. And then our good friend Dan from Retrofied came and visited and we hatched a plan. Now, instead of painting this, we're going to try applying a thick, slightly textured vinyl wrap to the sides of the cabinet. It matches very closely to the original finish and it's tough stuff. Normally this is used on cars to protect from stone chips, so it's more than up to the task of enthusiastic gamers. And if we're not happy, well then we just heat it up and peel it off and we can paint it instead. So it's a reversible process. Dan carefully applies the vinyl, making sure we don't get any air bubbles there. I'm not sure if it's that easy to work with or if he just makes it look that easy. It's surely the latter. This is his day job, by the way. He does this um, on sports cars primarily, so he really knows his stuff and how to get a good clean finish. And we do want a nice clean line around the edge for our T-mold. The last thing we want is to see rough curled up edges of stickers where the T-molding meets. That just makes the whole cabinet look cheap and we don't want that. Dan also makes vinyl wraps for classic computers and you can find them on retrofied.uk as well as other fun retro products. So do go and check that out. So with the base layer down and the edges carefully cut, now we want to apply the Megatech logo artwork on top. How cool does that look? My first impressions of this approach are excellent, but there's no time to stop and stare. There's still a lot to do. We'll come back and admire the result later. Let's crack on. Thank you, Dan. Right, with all the dirty work done, I'm happy now to take this up to the cave. So don't mind me, I'm just taking my Megatech Arcade for a walk across the car park and we'll lug it up into the cave along with all the parts to try and put this thing back together. Even without the monitors in this cabinet, this thing is heavy. But Alex tells me in his experience that Atari arcade cabinets are by far the heaviest. So I suppose we should be grateful really that it's not an Atari cab. And to think I once proposed putting the arcade itself up in the cave. It was a lucky escape. We've got a few more jobs to do now that all the parts are up here. 
Richard's joined us and he's going to be taking a look at the power supply while Alex and I are knocking on some T-Mold. And the T-Mold that we're using, this black T-Mold, it's got a story to tell too. This actually came from the workshop of none other than the late great Archer McLean. We were fortunate enough to receive some of his tools, parts and spares to use in the museum. Archer was an avid arcade collector and his legacy is helping to keep many arcades alive for others to enjoy. Hot glue and a rubber mallet are all we need to fit this and snips to help the tea mold around the sharper corners. Dan's also come up here with us as well to deal with the control panel which definitely needs to be refreshed. Nobody wants to be touching that do they? Well apart from Dan. The old art comes off leaving a really nasty residue and we tried all sorts to shift this from soapy water to IPA to meths and it did come off it was just really really hard going. So Dan popped outside and dunked it in some very aggressive paint stripper and that got the job done quickly. It's only metal after all so we weren't too worried about damaging it. We could have taken a flamethrower to this thing to be honest and it would have been fine. Dan then donned his 90s rave gloves, he forgot his whistle and he set about transforming our control panel. I love having all of these talented people around me with our shared passion to restore and preserve all of this stuff. Thank you, Dan, looking rightly proud of his work. And I'm sure he'll be back soon, whether it's helping out on Saturdays when he comes to help us with the public openings or helping with another restoration. You'll see more of Dan, I'm sure. Richard's up now and he's taking a look at the power supply. You saw our DIY CRT tester in the last episode. Well, this is the PSU load version one. And that simply simulates a load. It's like having the system board plugged in while we test the PSU without risking damage to the system board. He tests the transformer first. That takes 240 volts in or thereabouts because the mill is always a little over. So we've got power going in. Then the other side, that's set to give us an output to go into the cabinet of 120 volts. It's reading 130. And the 100 volt output is coming out at 108.5. Now these can be adjusted by simply moving the location of the connectors on the transformer. All in all though, it appears to be in good shape and Richard's happy with that. Now for our DC voltages. We've got here a 12 and a negative 12 volt output, that's fine. And we've also found our 5 volt output, so that's fine too. Finally, this is where it heads off into our wiring loom to serve the machine. So we tested there too, and Richard found that all is well. This temporary bodge here, that simulates the switches on the arcade cabinet doors being closed as it's designed to kill the power for safety if anyone opens the arcade cabinet when it's on. And that just gets around that for our testing. And you'll recall when we first removed the loom that there was a dodgy power cable which was soldered to it and taped onto it. Well, we've taken it off, there it is removed. And we'll put a new one on and that's all neatly heat wrapped. And we've used a tail instead of a wall plug so that we can easily disconnect and move the cabinet if we want to. The idea being if all our arcades have such tails, it's easier to swap them around. That's less of a problem up in the cave where I don't have so many arcades, but it's very useful down in the arcade archive. Richard's happy with the power and with the loom, so I'm happy. And now we can put as much of this as possible back into the cabinet we can test it and we can finish up for today. So back into the cabinet goes the system board, complete with a set of games. And you'll remember that we took the serial number off of the CPU when we cleaned it. So it'll be naked without it. We've got to put that back on. More cleaning now. I gave the marquee a final clean now that some replacement bolts had arrived and that smartens up the front. We don't want any rusty bolts visible. And then the wiring loom goes back in to connect everything up.
In goes the main monitor, the bezel and the glass. And now we are good for testing with our power supply and our loom in our gorgeous restored cabinet or well, partially restored cabinet. There's still some work to do on it. And here's where our story takes a twist for the worst. Yeah, it can't all be plain sailing, unfortunately. You'll remember in the previous episodes, we tested the system board, we tested the monitor, we had it in the other cabinet with its own wiring loom and PSU out the back here. Visitors came and tested it out for a day. Everyone was happy, it was all good. And I was expecting just to put it in this cabinet, switch it on and say, great, we're still in that good place. Not so, apparently. Here's what happened when we tested it. The Megatech powered on and it made encouraging noises, but the image was odd. Initially out of sync, which is easily fixed. We just needed to tweak that so that had been knocked. But then it was just blue. No matter what we tried, every game was blue and only blue. There was no green, there was no red, it was just blue. We checked the wiring loom was okay and it wasn't a bad connection. We got the contact cleaner out and wiggled everything to see that there was no glimmer of any other color. The problem seems to come down to our monitor, which was working before, so something has gone wrong. These things happen. I would love to tell you it's always plain sailing when it comes to restorations and present you with this lovely glossy video where nothing goes wrong, but this is where we are. And I'm confident that we've got the team around us here at the mill to get on top of that. I've already got Holly booked for Tuesday of this week to go over those monitors again. And I'm sure we'll get on top of it. Just, just to have the blue signal doesn't seem like too much of a problem. I'm pretty sure we can fix that. And then we'll figure out what we're doing with that 10 inch monitor. We also have the control panel to rebuild. The buttons are on back order and they are due to arrive today. Uh, just some of the colors were out of stock, but I wanted to make sure I matched exactly the type of buttons that we had in there originally, just to get that nice authentic finish. We need to cut boards, um, doors to go on the back because they're missing. We need to 3D print vent covers. Um, Got some special vent, here's a teaser for you. Some of the vent covers were 3D printed to go on the back and cover up those holes uh, and just finishing touches. And then I want to show you some of the games because it has quite a limited collection. So maybe I can narrow it down to my top five or something for you and actually show this thing in action. And if you'd like to come and see it in its current state or when it's finished, head to retrocollective.co.uk where you can book a visit to come here, hang out with me, have a cup of tea, try the Megatech and everything else that we've got here. That's at retrocollective.co.uk. And if you can't visit and you just love the videos that we make and what we do here, head to patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro where you can support the cause and become an official cave dweller. Thank you as always for taking the time to watch and I'll see you next time. Take care everyone. Bye-bye.